Welcome to the Side Hustle to Small Business podcast powered by Hiscox. I'm your host, Sanjay Parekh. Throughout my career, I've had side hustles, some of which have turned into real businesses. But first and foremost, I'm a serial technology entrepreneur. In the creator space, we hear plenty of advice on how to hustle harder and why you can sleep when you're dead. On this show, we ask new questions in hopes of getting new answers. Questions like, how can small businesses work smarter? How do you achieve balance between work and family? How can we redefine success in our businesses so that we don't burn out after year three? Every week, I sit down with business founders at various stages of their side hustle to small business journey. These entrepreneurs are pushing the envelope while keeping their values. Keep listening for conversation, context, and camaraderie. Chris Cassidy always loved collecting shoes, but not just shoes in general, but really, really nice sneakers. 20 years ago, he began selling collectible sneakers on eBay. As his experience and sales volume grew, he founded his company, 513 Kicks. Since 2017, Chris has managed 513 Kicks in addition to working a full-time job as a director of operations. For Chris, this is a true side hustle. Here today to share more about his business and teach us more about the shoe collecting world is Chris Cassidy. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, happy to be here. Anytime I can talk about shoes, I'm in a good spot. Well, I'm excited to talk to you about this because I don't think we've had anybody on the show yet that has talked about uh, shoes and collecting shoes and selling shoes. But before we get into the shoe stuff, talk to us a little bit about your background and give us a couple of minutes on uh, kind of how you got to where you are now. Yeah, of course. So 513 is Cincinnati's area code, coincidentally, born and raised in Cincinnati my whole life. Um, Big Bengals fan, uh, which is good. Uh, went to school here, went to the University of Cincinnati um, for marketing. Um, personally, I'm married. I have three young kids, all under 10. Um, so it keeps me busy in addition to the full-time job and the side hustle. And generally speaking, I just have always had a passion for business and creating things that I can control and manage myself and helping other people do the same thing. So uh, your kids have always known you selling sneakers because in the intro, I said that you've been doing this for 20 years. Uh, your kids are 10 years old. Is, is that what you said? The oldest. So they've always known you doing this. Correct. Yeah. I would say most people that know me connect me with sneakers in some way. And, <laughs> and yes, I have recruited my kids to help, you know, box some things up and drop it off at, you know, UPS or something. So it's fun. It's fun for I, them too. I mean, that that's the best way to launch a business because you get free uh, free manual labor there, right? So uh, yes, that's good stuff. So I, I got to ask you before I get into some of the other questions, are you wearing a pair of sneakers right now? And if so, which ones? Uh, yes, I'm wearing uh, Air Max 90 uh, white and infrared. It's like the most famous Air Max 90 model. You've probably seen them. Everyone's probably seen them if you, know, you look at them. So <laughs> great, great classic model. Yeah. So I, um, was this your first ever entrepreneurial venture doing these uh, shoes or did you have something even younger? Uh, like what was your first thing that you did entrepreneurially? Um, I would say this is it. You know, this is the first one. Obviously, it's grown over the years, which we'll obviously talk about. But right. I mean, I started selling shoes online when I was 10 years old, um, which is quite a while ago. Um, yeah. so there really wasn't much time for there to be something before that. <laughs> yeah. Did you, um, when you started doing this online, were you also selling to like other kids in school or anything else like that? Um, not really just cause mostly when you're 10, you know, you don't really, at least the kids around me didn't care what they were wearing cause they were more concerned <laughs> with like video games or something. So, right. um, there wasn't a strong market there. The kids didn't have the budget <laughs> to support it. <laughs> so I had to, I had to go outwards and, and, you know, break into the internet realm for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So before you started this though, was there anybody else in the family that was an entrepreneur that you got to watch and see kind of how they did things? Um, not really. I mean, my, my mom had like a, interior design type of business, um, kind of on the side, but nothing that like, I didn't really like use that as like a motivation or something. When I think back at it I'm like, yeah, oh, that makes sense. And we still have a, that bond where we'll talk about it and like bouncing right. off of each other. But at the time it was just like, I like shoes. I think I can make money selling them. Let's try it. Yeah. 
So w- when you started, was there like you were just selling on eBay? Um, you didn't actually have a company or anything else. Was there anybody helping you with kind of the mechanics of doing all of this stuff? Like, I'm sure somebody was driving you to wherever to ship this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, my, my dad, I needed him for a few things because A, <laughs> as a 10 year old, you can't have an eBay account. You can't have, you can't have like a bank account tied to it. So I was like, Hey pops, just trust me. Like, and then of course, you know, this was 25 plus years ago. Like the idea of selling things online, not, not a real thing for the normal person. So yeah, I definitely had to beg him to take me to the mall to buy inventory and then drop it off. But when he saw the numbers, you know, he, he got on board with it pretty fast. Yeah. So back in those days, you were going to the mall to, to buy inventory. What about now? Where do you get your inventory from now? Um, comes from two places primarily. One is online. So I've got my process out in where I can source in bulk online um, from normal websites that anyone can go to. But you have to pick your spots and know you know what's profitable and you can sell it in other places for more. And then as a result of me doing this for two and a half decades, I've got a strong base of people here locally or somewhere close that know me. So they will bring me inventory in exchange for money or I'll sell it in some sort of consignment fashion too. So it's a good balance of always having a steady flow of yeah. stuff to sell. So why is it that you think that uh, there's still, you, you know, there's this idea of like, hey, once everything's online, you know, price awareness uh, happens for everybody that there shouldn't be the opportunity for arbitrage. That's essentially what you're doing, right? You're just buying and selling. Uh, you don't make any of the shoes. So so you're, you're just figuring out what's going to sell and, and marketing the right way. Why do you think that's still an opportunity for somebody like you? Whereas, you know, like in economics theory, it should be like, well, price discovery, it should be easy to find out what the real price is and everybody pays the best price. Correct. Yeah, I think convenience is a huge factor. Um, simply put, um, shoes is a good example. One pair of shoes might sell on Amazon for 200 they might sell the exact same thing on eBay for 150 and that same pair of shoes might sell on a sneaker app like StockX or something for 100 bucks. Yeah. And the velocity might be 10 times higher on Amazon at a higher price too because people have been ingrained to use Amazon. It's convenient, it's fast, it's free shipping, but they're just buying because it's quick and easy and they know it versus doing research and seeing if it can be found cheaper. So right. convenience is a huge factor. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. So wh- you, you've you been doing this as a side hustle. You're still doing this as a side hustle. How much time is this actually taking you compared to like the full-time job? I, I'm assuming your regular job is a full-time job. Yeah. Yeah. Regular job, full-time job, definitely working, you know, 40 plus hours a week, probably more, um, <laughs> which is fine. And then the side hustle, um, I would say on average, probably about five hours a week. Some weeks, you know, just got done with the Christmas rush. I was definitely working more, yeah. um, getting pairs, you know, shipped out. So I do a lot of the fulfillment myself um, right now. So there's that. But, you know, there's some weeks where it's less. So I, on average, about five hours a week. Yeah. And and the place that you work, they're uh, supportive of you having a side hustle and know that you have a side hustle. Yeah. I mean, one of our values is flexibility. So like we don't have like a nine to five sit at your desk. Like we work remotely. We get our things done. We have KPIs. You know, I'm I'm running a multi-million dollar marketing agency as my full-time gig with good success. We have happy clients, great team, but then also running this side hustle that I've been running for 20 plus years. At the same yeah. Time. Has has the experience of uh, of the full-time job and being in marketing helped with 513 Kicks? I definitely think there's ways that it helps, but also ways that things that I've learned for 513 Kicks has helped what I do you know, for really? our clients. Yeah, interesting. because a lot of the clients that we work with are entrepreneurs and building their own law firm and hanging their own shingle. They're not working at like a law firm with 500 people. They're like them and a secretary. you know. So like right. the idea of building something yourself, which is something that's core to me, yeah. Like plays really naturally there. So there's definitely a, a crossover there. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I, I find interesting and I don't think we talk about so much is, is the fear of doing these things. And I think all entrepreneurs have some fear of something, um, although it's never portrayed that way in the media. 
Um, so I always like to ask this, like, what what scares you about this business? What has scared you? What does still scare you? Yeah, I think the fact that it is a true side hustle, I think my fears are lessened. You know, it's uh-huh. like my my livelihood is not dependent on how many pairs of shoes I sell this week. Right. You know, it's it's nice, but you know, I do have some forgiveness there, you know. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't mean that I'm not fearful on certain things. You know, if I buy a bunch of inventory on a whim that I think I'm going to be able to triple my money in six months, yeah, there's some fear associated with that. But I usually don't make bad investments in those yeah. type of things because I've been doing it so long, you know? Right. Um, I think the biggest fear or trap that you can fall into as an entrepreneur or someone that's like me in a side hustle is looking at what other people do and comparing yourself to that. And then that getting in your head too much and throwing you off course, you know, where it's like, oh, look how good they're doing when you're only seeing half the picture, like you said. You're not seeing the struggles and you're not seeing <laughs> right. the issues. You're only seeing the things they post. And it's like, they, they've got it nailed. And it's like, eh, like, check yourself sometimes and just think about how good you have, have it and how much you've made progress over the years. Yeah, you, you nobody posts about the hot mess uh, that's in the background. They only uh, post the pretty things at the end. So, I, how do you think about that in terms of dealing with that and managing um, the things that you're worried about and the things that you're fearful of in the business? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big planner and like goals and you know what's my revenue goal? How am I going to get there? You know. Um, what do I need to change? What, what things do I need to work on now? For example, like I never sold on Amazon historically in last, in the last year, I was like, I want to try it. Right. There's so much velocity and volume there. How's it going to go? I don't know until I try. So my goal is let's get, let's get that process going. It's going well so far, you know? So it's like, if you are measured and you have goals and processes in place, I think that helps mitigate a lot of this risk and anxiety around things that you can't control. You just yeah. got to really own the things you can control. Yeah. So um, I, as you've started this business, um, you started out just kind of out of the house type of thing. You had inventory in the house. Like, how did you manage holding on to all of these boxes of shoes? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, when I was 10 and, you know, still living at home, obviously I'd, you know, have stuff in my room or my closet. And then eventually it grew to like, I took over a big chunk of my parents' basement and then, <laughs> When I got married to my lovely wife and we bought a house, you know, I was like, Hey, I need this one room in the basement. Is that cool? And then it's like, yeah. And then of now, course, did she we had- know this before you got married or after you oh. got married? Oh, she knew. She knew. Yeah. She, she, it wasn't a surprise. Like, Oh yeah, I have this side Good. business. So like, Good. I mean, we paid for a big chunk of our wedding with shoe money, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> um, also paid for like half of my college education with quote shoe money. That's um, awesome. But yeah, so it's evolved from taking over portions of whatever residence I was in to now I have a storage unit, you know, or units um, full of inventory that I'm there multiple times per week, you know, shipping out and fulfilling orders just because I can't keep, you know, a thousand plus pairs in my garage. (laughs) Just not possible. (laughs) Right. So how do you um, like that feels daunting to me a little bit. How do you manage that inventory and keep track of where everything is. Yeah. So honestly, uh, free and easy Google sheets. Uh, I've got a really refined template that I've continued to tweak over the last feels like decade. Right. But everything is listed. Everything has a style number, everything has a size condition. Does it come with a box? Yes or no. Did I sell it? What did I pay for? What date did it sell? What platform? So at any point, I have a pulse on that. And then, of course, when it comes time to like do taxes and stuff, I've got a, a quick dump out to mirror in, you know, with other ways that I track revenue and profit. So it's it's a free way, but why overcomplicate things if you right. just need the data that you can trust, right, and not fly blindly with it? So it's worked really well. Yeah. So I, I've got to ask, um, do you know what's the oldest pair of shoes that you're still hanging on to and how long ago did you buy them? Um, I mean, I've definitely got some inventory that's a couple years old, which is fine. I, yeah. I definitely have pairs that, you know, I sell before they even arrive. Um, it's, it's about profit per pair that I look at. And if there's things that I want to clear out, I can easily do that. But yeah, um, yeah, definitely got some older pairs, but sometimes it's intentional because 
the price over time goes up as supply and demand kind of works its way out. Got it. Got it. So some of those might be that you actually haven't even listed them because you're just waiting for the, Correct. the demand yeah. to go up. Yeah. I mean, with anything, something releases, there's going to be a flood of people trying to sell and the market is going to adjust. Price is going to go down because availability is high. Flash forward six months from now, it's completely flipped. And it's like, I'll hold right. on to something for six months to make an extra 200 bucks or something. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So, um, so you've got these storage units. And obviously, you've built up inventory over time and you have probably a lot of money. You were saying thousand pairs. Um, you know, if we're just taking a rough guess at what, what each pair is worth, you know, 100 bucks, 200 bucks, that's a lot of money that you've uh, put into this. Um, which is unusual for what we're calling like a side hustle, but you've been doing it for so long. So how did you get to that point where you were able to build up that inventory? Was it you investing the money in or was it just reinvesting the profits from the business to get to that point? A um, lot of reinvesting for sure. Um, yeah. And when you know, like in my case, when I know what I'm buying and selling and it has a healthy margin and by healthy margin, like some pairs I sell, I ROI is, 200 plus percent, right? Like wow. um, some pairs, not as much, but you can see where it's a working system. If you just pour more gas on that fire and say, instead of selling five pairs this week, I want to sell 55, I want to sell a hundred. Then that's where the profits and stuff start to really compound. And then it's like, yeah, let's take that and buy another chunk or buy someone's shoe collection for 10 grand and then turn it into 20 grand six months from now. So yeah. what, it's it's not overnight by any means. I don't want to say that, but you have to get to that point where you can start to have that ability to make those decisions fast, to make those big decisions, to to buy something and make that investment because then it's going to pay off tenfold down the line. Yeah. So I, I since we're talking numbers, I'd love for you to share kind of ballpark what revenue uh, you make in a year. Like last year, 2022, like what are we talking about? Is this... $10,000? Yeah. Is it a million dollars? What is it? <laughs> I wish it was a million. That'd be a nice side hustle. Um, I would say uh, first 2021 was a good year, at least I thought. And then at, and I probably revenue wise was probably around 50. Um, and then going into 2022, as I said, I wanted to try new things and really just not be afraid to grow. Yeah. Um, which is like, was my theme. I was like, let's just stop being afraid. Right. Like if I right. get too big, then I got to worry about these things. I was like, well, those are good things to worry about. <laughs> so I would say in 2022, I haven't tallied everything because I have multiple channels of revenue, but it, I'd be confident to say it's probably between 125 and 150, um, okay. revenue. So a, a good, sol good solid profit. growth from 2021. Yeah. Oh yeah. This is my, of all the years doing this, but been my best year. Yeah. So far. And and for that, uh, on average, how much time do you spend on the side hustle? Um, probably five hours a week, max. Um, it, it fluctuates, but on average, if you were to extrapolate it for the year, probably yeah. five. Yeah. And, and, and I'm imagining those five hours a week for you, uh, they're fun five hours a week, mostly. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It, it doesn't feel like work and it's been something I've literally been doing. Like I buy shoes for myself and my kids and my wife. So it's like, <laughs> where does the line stop? You know, it's like, Hey, I want to buy those for my son. But if I buy 10 of those other pairs, I can sell them and pay for his and then some, you know? So like, that's just kind of how I approach it. Yeah. I love that. So talking about family, how do you balance, um, kind of the stress, uh, and demands of owning this side hustle as well as family life and all of the things that that requires? Yeah, I think boundaries are key. I think um, knowing when to shut off certain things and be all in on others is huge. So I'm a big uh, calendar person and time chunks and time blocks, which I know is not is nothing new. I didn't pioneer that by any means. But that helps me stay true to my routine and really know like what my week is going to look like. So when I leave work, when I get home, that's all in family time. You know, we got basketball practice or whatever, but it's family time. I'm not, you know, doing shoot things or things for work. Like, and then once the kids are to bed, me and my wife are watching Netflix or hanging out, you know, but then, you know, wake up, start my new routine and follow, you know, my, my plan that I know has worked for me and I've adapted it to, yeah. to what works best. Yeah. How do you, uh, do you fit in uh, exercise as a part of that routine and, and where do you fit that in? Yeah. Um, 
obviously there's room for improvement there just like anything else. But I will say what I've learned is that if that's the first thing I do when I wake up, it will get done more often than not. If, if I say, let's get it knocked out first before I open my phone and get distracted or start doing these things, it's like, let's just get that knocked out. And then it kind of just sets the tone for the day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that great advice, uh, before getting distracted. I know that's so easy to do, especially for me, but, um, let's talk about, uh, kind of a little bit of the marketing side of it. Your, your website, you've say you've got over 2000 five-star reviews. Um, what advice would you give to other owners, uh, business owners about, you know, running an e-commerce site and, and running it successfully to make sure that you get that level of engagement as well as reviews? Like a lot of people are happy, but they're not willing to leave the review either, right? So you've got to complete the path all the way through. So how did you get there? Yeah, I mean, in this niche, I know what the experience is like to buy a pair of shoes online and and what it is to be the customer. So my goal is to always let me do something different to actually be memorable and wow them. So I'm not going to wait two days to ship something. Like if you buy a pair of shoes right now, I'll probably stop at my storage unit on the way home and drop it off, you know? So it's like when people leave a review, they're like fastest shipping ever. And it's like, (laughs) how did I get it tomorrow? It's like, are you Amazon? It's like, so like, (laughs) but it's the little things where it's like the difference of me dropping it off today versus tomorrow at eight o'clock is at least one business day for them to receive right. it, right? Or more, because it's going to sit at UPS or whatever for the whole day until it goes out at five o'clock. So right. like, that's the way that I think. I'm like, if I can do this one thing to add five minutes to my day, but it cuts the delivery time by two days, that's huge. I'm yeah. going to get a good review. When I ship something, You know, they get a business card, they get a, like a little sneaker keychain or something that I paid 50 cents for, but people remember that. Like, the little things like that just go a long way. And then also asking for reviews, right? Don't be scared. <laughs> like, hey, you like that pair of shoes? Great. Hey, can you leave a review for me on Google or can you leave it on eBay or whatever it is? Just asking. If you don't ask, your chances of getting it are slim to none. Yeah. Yeah. People people are busy. They're not going to think about you once they got yeah. your, their thing. So uh, I like that. Um, so let's talk about kind of the, the systems. We talked a little bit about what you've got in place with Google Sheets and and using those kinds of things. What other kind of technologies or apps or systems have you used to help you grow uh, this business and manage it in, in the way that you do? Yeah, um, I think I rely heavily on process that I've developed, which is not like a fancy system or software. Um, but I do have some software you know, tools that are in my stack, if you will. So there's a, a software called Keeper. It's Keeper Tax. Um, you just hook your you know, similar to like QuickBooks or something like that, but you hook your accounts up and then you can quickly classify via text message what buckets they go in. So like I'll get a daily roll up where it's like, here's 10 transactions from yesterday. You just put the numbers and which go to which bucket, you know, which one's a business expense, you know, one, two, seven, and eight. Cool. So then that is just like a quick way to stay on top of my books, which then I obviously have to spend more time on when it comes to tax time. But it streamlines a big thing um, as far as that goes to make sure expenses are going in the right bucket. I also have a, a cross posting software that's free. It's called Fly P, which is a strange name. But when you list something on eBay with a few more clicks, I can list it on other marketplaces, which is huge, oh. right? So it's like Poshmark and Mercari and other places where people are spending time. And I've sold probably just through that, probably it added an additional twenty five or thirty thousand dollars last year just by implementing that quick thing. So do, does it do the reverse? Because one of the challenges I've seen is if you're listing the same product on multiple sites, you've got to go in and close those mm-hmm. sales out once you sell it on one of them. Does it help you with the reverse? Yeah. So you you can go in there with one click and say sold and then it's going to delist them everywhere. It's nice. It's, it doesn't have the map back to say, oh, it's sold on eBay. Let me automatically do that. But right. it's a one click thing, which is good enough for me right now. Yeah. Um, and the fact that it's free, I'm like, there's no downside to it. They have other p- paid things, I'm sure. But that piece of it is free to me and it's easy to use. Yeah, I like that. Um, good recommendations. So uh, let's kind of do a little bit of a right. Re- you've got a long retrospective to do potentially with 20 plus years of doing this. If you could go back in time and do something differently or do multiple things differently, what would it be and, and why? 
Um, two big things is like really change. I wish I could have changed my mindset earlier in terms of not being afraid of growth, like I said earlier. So like I was so compartmentalized and this is a side hustle. And in my mind, it was like, it'd be cool if I made, you know, $20,000 in revenue. And it was like, for some reason, it was like, that's just the ceiling. And I was like, I can't do more than that. And it, then it's like, why? So like, that was like the big realization over the last couple of years. It's like, I know this process, it's just rinse and repeat and just really lean into the growth and not be afraid of it. Um, that's not always true for every business, right? Sometimes it's like you're grasping for the last, you know, straw it feels like. In this case, the more I put in, I feel like the more I can get out. Um, I haven't reached that point of diminishing return yet. So that's great. And the other piece is like putting more intentionality around planning and goals. I wish I would have done that earlier, right? Saying, what do I want to do this year, whether it's revenue or chop off a new, you know, test or something. Like I wish I would have started doing that earlier. Yeah. What was it that that kicked you into that of of doing that planning? Was it somebody telling you or you just realizing it or did you read a book? Like what what caused you to do that? Um, I think at my you know, day job, I preach that a lot to our clients, right? Like when we talk about marketing budgets or, you know, what do we want to do next year? Here's what I'm thinking. But I never like did that for myself, for my business. And I was like, this is ridiculous. So started to do that. And, you know, if we have a plan to follow, the chances are we're going to hit our marks a lot easier than if we're just blindly hoping that we do something good. Um, So it's been, it's been uh, a good move for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, so a couple of last questions. What would you tell somebody that's thinking about launching a side hustle like you um, in terms of you know how to get started or, or what to do or, or why they should? I think you really have to be passionate about it for sure, because there's going to be good days and there's going to be bad days. And mm-hmm. you don't want to be so close to the edge where you're like, this is just too bad. I'm just going to close up shop and be done with it. Because who knows of the the greatness you could have missed out on. So if you don't have that passion from the start and that like, heck yeah, I'm going to run through the wall type of mentality, then figure out if you need to do something else like a different business or something, because you should really feel that, um, at least in my opinion. And you should really know, obviously, what you're getting yourself into, which sounds typical and cliche, but it's like, what's going to happen if things go really well? What's going to happen if things don't go well? Um, if it's a side hustle, you're okay. Like risks are mitigated, but it's like thinking about those contingency plans and and really, you know, being set up for success, I think is huge. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, okay. Now the, the one question, particularly about your, the product you deal with the day in and day out sneakers, what's one tip or trick that our listeners should know about how to get sneakers or take care of their sneakers or, or whatever it is. What's the one thing everybody should know that you know that most people don't? Um, Yeah, expand your horizons when you're searching for a specific pair. Like I said, like, don't just go to one place. Like, there's probably a pretty good chance that shoe is somewhere else, you know, online. Um, And the easiest way, honestly, is search the style code. So, like, each shoe has a a set of numbers or sometimes letters mixed in. Nike is six digits followed by three digits. Search that into Google you will find a lot more returns than if you were to just like search the shoe name. So there's a little hack for you if you're looking for a specific pair or if you're, your kid's like, I really want this one shoe. It's like find the style code and then search that. Love that. Yeah. What, what about taking care of our shoes? Is there something we should be doing that most people don't do? Um, first, don't throw them in the washing machine and the dryer. <laughs> 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 Unless it's like a kit, like a pair of Crocs or something. Um, you know, just... I would say it's hard for me to answer that because I have so many shoes. I don't really have beat up shoes, but, uh, <laughs> um, but just, you know, don't step in the mud puddles. And if you do just wipe it off, <laughs> wipe it off as soon as you can. I love that. Yeah. Uh, yep. Chris, where can our listeners find and connect with you? Yeah. So 513kicks.com is my website. Um, there's some inventory on there if you're looking to buy shoes, but a lot of my inventory is like going to be on like eBay or Amazon. Um, so that's, if you're curious about what I'm selling, if you want to reach out to me, info at 513kicks.com, or you can find me on Instagram by searching the same thing, um, or any social media, really I'm anywhere. Awesome. Thanks again for coming on, Chris. Thank you. Really appreciate it. 
Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Side Hustle to Small Business podcast, powered by Hiscox. To learn more about how Hiscox can help protect your small business through intelligent insurance solutions, visit hiscox.com. That's H-I-S-C-O-X dot com. And if you have a story you want to hear on this podcast, please visit hiscox.com slash share your story. I'm your host, Sanjay Park. You can find me on Twitter at at Sanjay, that's S-A-N-J-A-Y, or on my website at sanjayparek.com.